Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to see such a great turnout today. As mentioned, my name is Bon Carter, and I'm the Industrial Business Manager here at Gravotech. I look forward to spending time with you guys today talking about identification and traceability, as well as the implementation of the FDA UDI program. So as the business manager, a couple of the things that I do is I help organizations implement best practices and establish written standards for identification and traceability. And when uh, the organization wants to roll that out globally, I coordinate with our subsidiaries to ensure the same level of support and the same information uh, is transferred to all of the sites. So I recognize that a lot of you are wearing many hats and probably on a limited time schedule today. So I'm going to save all of the questions that we get and answer those at the end of the presentation. And if we don't happen to get to your question, I'll apologize in advance, um, but I'll either reach out myself personally or one of my colleagues will reach out and we'll do our best to walk you through uh, the process and answer the question that you've put forward. So today, I'm going to present a little bit about Gravotech as a general introduction, and then we'll jump into uh, why and how to implement UDI marking. To start things off, I thought I'd share a little bit of experience and expertise that we at Gravotech have. A lot of areas around the world are ahead of the U.S. and have been as far as implementing regulation and legislation to track medical devices throughout their life cycle. So we've been doing this with various hospitals and various governments around the world for well over 15 years. And one of the examples I thought I would pull out is the French legislation, which required uh, records of medical equipment to be traceable to the last five patients in contact with an instrument. And so the regulation came out, but it didn't really clearly define how that was to happen. And so we worked with various uh, manufacturers, hospitals, and other organizations to implement and roll out a reliable and repeatable process. So the example here is the CHPL, or the Lori Private Hospital Center, and they were operating on uh, up to 100 patients a day, and with that, utilizing um, some of their 20,000 instruments in their inventory. And so we worked with them to get the identification and unique identification on each of those devices. And then we helped them take that to the next level, which is not just identifying and tracking the last five patients, but using that information and using that information to follow the inventory, to follow the maintenance, to follow the sterilization, and a lot of other activities surrounding that data. So Gravotech, um, whether you as an individual recognize it or not, we are really everywhere um, in the world. So we have solutions that mark uh, jewelry that may be on your hand or around your neck. Uh, we have equipment that marks uh, VIN numbers on the vehicle uh, that you traveled in or identification plates on the airplane or train or other components. And we even mark serial numbers and other identifying information on implants and devices uh, inside your body. So wherever you look, um, you'll find Gravotech. Hopefully that's not on something that's supposed to be inside of you, but everywhere else you look, hopefully you find Gravotech. We're most recognized by our brands, um, Type 3, that's our artistic CAD CAM solution. Technifor, that is our integrated and offline dot peen and Galvo laser solutions. And Gravograph primarily focuses on ra rotary engraving machines and benchtop lasers. So, our equipment is manufactured in one of three main sites, either in North America, Europe, or Asia. And from these three manufacturing platforms, um, we've successfully installed over 200,000 solutions. And we have happily 60,000 customers, and we're supporting 100 countries through our 26 subsidiaries and our network. Each of these manufacturing facilities gives us operational redundancy. 
Unfortunately, in the recent news, we've heard of uh, earthquakes and tsunamis, uh, volcano eruptions, all of these things can disrupt supply chains. And so with that, we can uh, overcome some of the obstacles that smaller companies uh, face and struggle with. So now that I've given a little bit of history on uh, Gravotech and the fact that we've been around since the 30s and we manufacture across the globe and that we have experience in the, the global medical market, I would like to share a little bit about what's going on here in the U.S. So the UDI uh, program from the FDA really rolled out in September 2013, and there was a rule that was established uh, for a common system for product identification applied to all medical devices in the U.S. market. So this system is to adequately identify the medical devices through their distribution and use, and the marks need to be in both human-readable form so something that we can look at and easily decipher and understand, as well as machine-readable form, which typically you'll pull out and use a vision system or these days a smartphone uh, to read. So the organizations or persons that physically label these devices, they have to submit certain information about each device to the FDA's um, global unique device identification database. And you'll see a lot of these acronyms uh, throughout the presentation. I'll, I'll try not to overdo it with them. So with this uh, new program rolling out, uh, the FDA has created a portal called Access GUDID. And that gives everyone access to the information. So patients, caregivers, healthcare providers, hospitals, um, you or I, as individuals, we can go on to this access portal and we can pull out information and search for information on specific medical devices and we can download a lot of information um, about those devices. So the data that's in there, it comes on a daily basis from uh, the manufacturer or from you as your um manufacturing a device and creating it and then logging it into the system. So the ultimate goal for the UDI system and this global database is to improve patient safety, it's to modernize the post-market surveillance, and it's really to facilitate medical device innovation. So there's a lot of political background on, on why a system is good or not good. And I thought I would share early on in the presentation a real life experience of why this program and how this program can be good. So in this real life um, experience um, reported by CBS News in 2009, there was a surgical clip called the Hemolock and there was an urgent recall issued out to doctors. It was stop using this device on living kidney donors. The clip could come dislodged um, or undone, and there are consequences of this uh, up to life-threatening to death. Unfortunately, with this recall notice and this communication, that message was very difficult to distribute throughout the network. Who bought these clips? Who has these clips? Who has already returned the clips? Nobody had a clear idea of uh, what was going on within the, the true marketplace. And so a surgeon in Brooklyn, unbeknownst to him about this notice going on, he used one of these clips um, to tie off a renal artery and a gentleman named Michael King after he had donated his kidney to his ailing wife. And not, only, not 12 hours later, the clip popped off and Mr. King unfortunately uh, bled to death while he was in a hospital bed next to his wife. And what a tragic event for someone so young uh, to have that happen when it could easily have been stopped through better communication and through this new UDI rule that's being rolled out. This type of event should never happen. 
And so these are the real world examples. And there's many of these examples um, that the program is designed to help uh, stop. And then there's other benefits that can be taken um, outside of that. So the basics of the UDI rule. So the basics are that the label of every medical device will bear a unique device identifier. Uh, think of a VIN number for a vehicle. And the label of the device must provide the information for each model or version of that. So previously, the government was using the National Health Related Items Code or the National Drug Codes. Um, but with the new ruling, those techniques will really be phased out um, over time. So a UD mark is really a way of formatting data within a human readable and a machine readable code. And it's primarily consists of two parts. The first is a device identifier, a DI, as you'll see, and that mandatory portion identifies who labeled the product and the specific version or model of that device. The second is a PI, and that's a variable portion of the UDI, and that identifies one or more of the following items. The lot or batch number from where the device was manufactured, the serial number, expiration date, and manufacture date. As with anything, there are exceptions to the rules. So if it's a human cell or tissue-based product, that requires a distinct identification code um, per a certain section of the rule as released by the FDA. Now, this is an example of a UDI mark on a package, and you can see that it illustrates the manufacturing company and address, the brand of the device, the single usability of the product, storage requirements, expiration date, serial number, etc. So highlighted in the orange, we have the device identifier. This is the assigned number from the FDA, and that is required to be present. We also have two product identifiers, the expiration date and the serial number. And all of this information is encoded in two forms, one in a linear barcode and one in a data matrix code. So the benefits of the UDI marking, as I alluded to earlier, are numerous. Uh, first, helps reduce medical errors by being able to recall products, as I shared. It also helps fight counterfeiting, uh, increases the time for patient cases, and it improves the ordering and invoicing process, as well as inventory management, um, and the efficiency of documents in patients' electronic health records. So we can start to build out all of the benefits associated with uh, this program from the FDA. So there's three different types of forms a UDI mark can take. On the top left, we have a QR code. On the top right, we have a data matrix code. And on the bottom center, we have a linear barcode, something that most of us are familiar with, with the top two becoming more prevalent. And we'll start seeing them and have started seeing them on utility bills and other places within uh, our life. So a QR code, it's abbreviated from a quick response code. And that type of uh, matrix or two-dimensional barcode, it was really first designed for the automotive industry in Japan. And where you'll see that more often than not is on labeled products. Data matrix codes, so on the top right, that two-dimensional barcode, um, it can either be a square as seen here or a rectangle. And that's a code consisting of the black and white cells. And that was really made popular in the aerospace and automotive industries and adopted by the government with UID, which is the predecessor to UDI. And that was for components that the military purchased to be able to track um, costing and other things related uh, to those devices. So the benefits of a data matrix code is that it's a very compact code and you have a high encoding capacity. So you can put a lot of data in that small area. 
you have a minimum contrast requirement of only 20%. The reading of that code can be any orientation 360 degrees. So the equipment used to decipher that can be held at any angle around that. And there's also error correction built into the code. So there's redundancy where if that code becomes damaged, it can still be read. On the bottom, we have a linear barcode, which most people are familiar with. And that one, as you can see, is made up by uh, varying widths of lines and spaces. And a couple of the challenges with that compared to a data matrix code are the length. So as you're encoding data, your format is restricted in length. You have a contrast requirement of 80%. Your reading angle is only plus or minus three degrees. And finally, there's no error correction. So as that code becomes damaged, you don't get a read on that. So to reiterate some of the benefits of a data matrix code, you have a lot of information in a small area, a generous reading tolerance, and uh, error correction built into the code itself. Another benefit is that we're not altering the ergonomics of the tool or the device um, by directly marking that on the product itself. It doesn't impact how um, a surgeon or a user will touch and interact uh, with the device. So how does your company go about receiving a unique device identifier? Well, there's one of three issuing agencies, also known as IAs. There's GS1, located in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. There's HIBIC, located in Phoenix, Arizona. And then there's ICCBBA, located in San Bernardino, California. So these companies, you'll reach out to them, and they will be able to help you navigate and begin receiving the unique device identifier. So the government is rolling out the FDA rule, as many of you probably know, um, over five stages. And part of that is not to overwhelm the issuing companies. So they all take place, to keep things simple, on September 24th. And only the year and the class changes. So we've got the devices in categories class one, two, and three. And so the class one devices are devices that are low risk and they have the least regulatory control. And those would be examples, band-aids, latex gloves, et cetera. And then we have class two devices and class two devices, obviously they're higher risk or perhaps not obviously they're higher risk than class one. And they require a bit greater regulatory control um, to ensure there's a reasonable um, assurance of the device safety and effectiveness. So an example would be an effusion pump, acupuncture needles, those are classified as class two devices. And then class three devices, which you see is broken up into the packaging and then the device itself, those are usually the highest risk items and subject to the highest control. And so those you can think of as devices that need to go to the FDA um, and be approved before they're marketed. So an example could be a replacement heart valve or a pacemaker. So with the rollout, uh, you can see that the packaging has already been done in 2014. In 2015, we have implantable life supporting and life sustaining devices that need to bear the UDI mark. And then coming up here in 2016, uh, we have the devices um, themselves that need to be labeled with a UDI mark. Uh, that are class three and then 2018 class two devices require a UDI mark. So as we know, devices are manufactured from a wide range of materials and you can probably see materials that you're familiar with um, on the screen here. And these devices um, and materials can often be labeled or they can be marked directly. So why mark directly on a device uh, as issued for the class three while well, reusable devices that require reprocessing so cleaning and uh, disinfection and sterilization um, those that can be reused those devices need to have the mark directly on them 
Uh, again, exceptions to rules, if it interferes with the safety or the use of the device, or it's not technically feasible, so on and so forth, there's some nuances to it. But when looking at direct part marking, you can really apply a mark with one of two technologies efficiently and not affect the use and the ergonomics of it. One way would be using laser marking, and the other would be through dot peening or mechanical marking. And these two devices only differ in how the mark is applied. With laser, it's light, which is being used to change or alter the surface of the device. And with dot peen marking, it's a mechanical stylus, which is creating uh, multiple impacts to create the mark. So both of these technologies are um, adapted and used on a wide range of materials. A lot of these materials you'll probably recognize um, in use for the devices that you have come in contact with. Um, and sampling is a great way to identify which, which um, technology is going to be most appropriate for a particular material. So we've got two videos here and want to share a little bit on laser marking first. So in the first video, I'm going to go ahead and click play. And as you can see, you can pull these videos up off of YouTube. So what we're going to see first is we're going to see direct part marking. And so the laser is etching a mark onto the surface of a device. And it's going to leave behind a small, highly contrasted and readable mark, both in human and machine readable. And then we're going to have a scenario where a device doesn't have a clean surface but requires a mark. And the laser is going to do a cleaning pass and then create a permanent mark on top of that. And then in the third segment here, we're going to take an entire layer off of uh, the device. And so that's great for those rating plates that need to be attached to things. For example, anodized aluminum and a contrasting color is left and very easy to read. And then the next one, we're creating a black mark here on the device surface. And then last, we're going to show a little bit of deep engraving, uh, less common in uh, UDI marking or machine readable marking. Um, unless it's a very harsh environment. So we'll go ahead and we'll play our second video here. And this one's going to show some data matrix codes and UDI marks directly on to some different devices. So really quickly, going to create uh, a code here, a machine readable code, just drag and drop. And that can also be resized and positioned uh, precisely through the software there. Um, here, we don't have a fixture set up, and we're just going to align everything under a red aiming diode uh, with a preview of where the mark is going to take place, and then etch the code itself. So if we wanted to add some text to this as well, we could very easily take this data in from um, an external software and automated into a production line, a PLC or other things, or back-end software and IT systems. So it can all come in through variables over various communication methods. And the video, we're just going to type it in quickly. And then again, um, we can position, preview, and mark the information in both a data matrix code and human-readable text in under two seconds. So it's a very quick process. Contrasting mark makes it very easy to read, um, very high throughput. So we manufacture lasers in different formats to help our customers and help fit their needs. So we have uh, first the technology, we have fiber, green, hybrid, and CO2. So fiber is very good for um, highly contrasted marks on uncoated metals. Green, we're using that on um, electronics and certain plastics, as well as some precious metals. 
Hybrid. Um, Hybrid is really good on shiny and reflective materials. It's also very good on certain types of plastic. And then CO2 is great for organic marking um, of woods and papers and plastics and things like that, painted surfaces, coated surfaces. So at the bottom here, what you see in the left two pictures are Galvo lasers. And these lasers can be integrated directly into the production line. There's some special safety requirements around uh, using those lasers. And in fact, the manufacturers of laser equipment also register their product with the uh, FDA and the CDRH uh, division. So we are not unique um, or we're not unfamiliar with the FDA, I should say. And then on the right, we have one version and they come in many versions of an enclosed laser. And that um, allows a user or an operator to set in um, a batch of tools or a batch of parts or large parts and mark directly on them with no additional safety considerations because the class of device that that is. So very safe process. So we have solutions that fit a wide range of applications in the marketplace. So now we're going to take a look at a dot peen video. And in this video, what you'll see is the operator using a universal clamp or fixture where many different types, types of parts could be um, held without adjustment. There's a red aiming diode which points to where the mark is going to take place. And then the stylus came over and made a series of mechanical impacts into the tool. In any good process, you want to read right after you mark it. And that's so that you don't um, manufacture something, mark it, send it through additional processes, and then get to the end of the process. You've built out a tool, added extra cost, and uh, only to find out that you can't read um, the mark that's put there. As you can see cycling through, um, clamping can hold many different types of tools, especially useful for um, inventory that already exists and is already out in the field. So the different types of solutions from Gravotech. So we have integrated solutions on the bottom left here. Um, there's a laser that's integrated into a production line of medical biofluid fluid vials. And those biofluid vials, um, each one is marked with human readable text and a data matrix code. Then the entire series is read from a vision system. And in this example, and in this example, you can see the red LED lighting that improves the readability of the code. And you have a vision system here. And at Gravotech, we've gone and we've qualified um, a number of vision partners uh, that we work with. So we're the experts in marking. Uh, we know experts in vision equipment, and we can help uh, introduce you to those that will make your application and process successful. So we manufacture integrated solutions both in laser and dot peen. And then we have standalone solutions that also are both laser and dot peen. And these standalone stations are great for marking, uh, again, tooling that already exists, parts that already exist, instruments that exist out in the field. So to help you identify the right technology, um, or really those that are wanting to launch their process as quickly as possible and be prepared for um, the next milestone that's just around the corner, we are here to help you. So if you need help identifying uh, which solution, we can process samples for you, and that will allow you to take those samples back, um, not only put them through your manufacturing process and ensure that the mark lives, but um, do testing on those parts Make sure it doesn't change the ergonomics. Um, make sure that your marketing team buys into it. A lot of uses for uh, processing those samples. And to have that done, just simply reach out to us, send us an email, um, or fill out our form on the website, letting us know that you would like to have some samples processed, and we would be happy to do that for you at no charge. With that, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning into our presentation, and I hope that you found some useful information in what I've shared, and I would be happy to answer any questions that uh, might have come up from the group.
Okay, Bon, thank you very much for that very informative presentation. Now, we'd like to take some questions from our attendees, if that's okay with you. But before we do, let's remind everyone that if we don't get to your question, don't worry. We'll have an answer for you after the webinar. The complete Q&A transcript, including answers we don't have time for, will be sent to all of our registered attendees and will be posted with the webinar when it goes into the on-demand mode. Okay, Bon, here's our first question. You mentioned sample marking, but how do I know the mark will survive my entire manufacturing process? That's a really good question. Um, we've done different things with different customers. We've done engineering studies where a certain quantity of product was uh, marked and manufactured and put through the process. And then we've done um, smaller studies uh, just doing a certain number of samples uh, that have been put through individual offline tests. So if you'd like to reach out to us, we'd be happy to work through your individual circumstances and see what we can do to help you evaluate that. Okay, thanks, Bon. Here's another question. Would you be able to come to my offices to talk about the content in this webinar? We would be happy to come out and do an individual presentation uh, tailored specifically to you with adjusted content, if you like. Um, more technical, less technical, uh, more about the standards, so on and so forth. Uh, so again, feel free to reach out to us. We would be happy to come out to your site. Um, we've got a number of options uh, for walking through that process with you. Okay, thanks very much, Bon. Here's another question. We already have laser marking equipment. Am I able to turn on this functionality? Probably. Um, a lot of laser manufacturers do have the ability to mark data matrix codes. Two things that you want to look out for is that you have the data formatting correct uh, with both the printable and non-printable characters. And then depending on the age of your equipment, you can also evaluate a lot of new functions and features that have been rolled out with lasers, uh, built-in reading, um, built-in adjustment of the focal distance. And so there can be some benefits to tackling and investigating new equipment. However, um, a lot of existing equipment can support um, the marking of data matrix and UDI codes. And here's another question for you, Bon. Does Gravitech offer any print and apply labeling solutions? No, unfortunately, Gravitech, we do not get into anything that is not permanent. So we only deal in permanent direct part marking or permanent uh, labeling of products. So we'll mark a label and that label can be attached, but the mark that's on the label is a permanent mark. So any type of stickering solution um, or labeling solution like that, we don't manufacture. However, if you have a need, um, you can reach out to us. We do know some uh, companies within the uh, industry, and we could potentially hook you up and um, align you with someone that can, can provide you a solution. Okay, and here's a question that simply asks, what about reading the marks? Reading is a very important question. So I mentioned a little bit about that. We don't manufacture vision equipment, but we have gone through that process of qualifying vision companies that we know um, represent and equal the quality of machine that we manufacture. And so reading is something that you want to do directly after you mark the part. And I explained that you want to do that so that it goes through the process um, you know that you've got a good mark on there. Now you can add reading stations in the process and that can also add value. So you can do in-process setup, um, adjusting uh, machine parameters. You can be recording much more data than the FDA requires. So you can read a particular unique code and save the machining data about a particular device and really start to build out that value. Um, again, uh, we'd be happy to go into greater depth uh, with you. Lighting is an important consideration uh, and almost as equally as important as the, the vision system that's used. So we'd be happy to evaluate your individual and particular needs and, um, and do that on site with you. Okay, Bon, that's going to do it for today. We're going to have to wrap up this webinar right there. Thanks so much for spending some time with all of us today.
Thanks again, everyone, for your time. I hope you all have a great day, and please do reach out. Again, thanks for taking the time to join us for this webinar event. Take care, and we'll talk to you soon.